All right. Welcome again. If y'all want to open in your Bible to Luke chapter uh, 23, I believe it is. Luke chapter 23. We are, as we mentioned a moment ago, looking at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're doing this as we're harmonizing the four accounts of the gospel. And so we're going to be in Luke chapter 23. I apologize, I forgot to mention a few moments ago. Huh? Susan. I, her name just went flying away like a little bird. Susan. She sat right there. And I, I apologize. Uh, her surgery went well. She's even writing right now with that hand. So. Yeah, so uh, we're glad that that surgery went well. Glad to have her uh, with us this evening. So we're looking at the various accounts as they're revealed in the Word of God about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and ultimately His ascension to the right hand of God where He had set, as far as we can tell, throughout eternity. He had always been in the presence of the Father. And so uh, the Bible says in Luke 23 and verse 36 that the soldiers also mocked Him, coming to Him and offering Him vinegar and saying, If thou be king of the Jews, save thyself. And the superscription also was written over Him in the letter, letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, this is the King of the Jews. Uh, you know, we, uh, we, we often, and, and, and it's sad, but there is, a, uh, I believe, a misunderstanding about people uh, of the past. And uh, they, they say, and, and I even heard a guy say it recently, that people in the first century, for the most part, were illiterate. They didn't know how to read. They didn't know how to write. Uh, and I want you to notice what the superscription, the, the writing above uh, the head of Jesus was written in three languages. Now, why would they take the effort to write it in three languages if the people there didn't know how to read? They wrote it in Greek, which was the common trade language that most everybody, especially those that were involved uh, in any kind of trade would be able to speak the Greek language. It was written in Latin, which was the language of Rome. And so those people that were there as the uh, oppressors of the people of God at that time, they were under Roman rule, they could read that superscription and what it said. And then it was right, written in the, the actual language of the Jewish people, the Hebrew language. It was written in three languages. So why would you go to that kind of effort if nobody could read or write? It doesn't make sense to me. And so the superscription said, this is the king of the Jews. Verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself. And what's those next two words? And us. And us. There might have been a little bit of... Uh, uh, what would you say, uh, personal gain in that? Well, I'm mocking him and I'm making fun of him, but just in case, if you can do this, don't forget to take me uh, with you when you come down off that cross. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? It's kind of like, and I've heard this has happened, I don't know that it's true, guys going down death row, and you've got the prisoners that are <laughs> waiting to go to death row and they're, they're teasing him. Uh, used to be, you could read this in some of the, the writings, uh, they would talk about, oh, you're going to go ride old lightning, talking about the electric chair. Can you imagine teasing someone about their impending death when you're waiting for your turn to ride the lightning? I don't understand how folks are, but they are that way. And so this man said, wait a minute. You're in the same condemnation as He is, and you're not fearing God. He says in verse 41, And we indeed justly, 
Uh, we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. Um, what do you see in this? And, and, and we all have heard all the, the sayings about the thief on the cross. What do you see in this man? I see repentance. He knew Jesus to see repentance in what he's doing. And uh, I think this man has had a change of heart. And so he said, Jesus has done nothing amiss. Verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Uh, we know that that verse of Scripture has been used repeatedly to try to deny the essentiality of baptism. And we also realize that uh, that is a misapplication of that verse of Scripture. And we know it for various reasons, but just quickly turn to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Jesus has just healed a man, and He healed that man in verse 5 by saying He was paralyzed. He said, Sons, thy sins be forgiven me. Mark 2 in verse 5. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were, verse 6, certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their heart. Verse 7, why did this man speak blasphemies? They thought it was blasphemous for Jesus to say, thy sins are forgiven. By the way, we would understand that if Jesus were a mere man, that would be a presumptuous sin. Mm -hmm. For someone as a man to say to someone else, I pronounced your sins forgiven, that would be, uh, we would be standing in the place of God. God is the only one that has the ability to forgive our sins. And so they thought that Jesus was speaking blasphemy because he said in verse 7, well, who can forgive sins but God only? God's the only one that can do that. They had that right, though. They did? <laughs> yeah. They absolutely did. Didn't and know. immediately. I'm sorry? But they didn't, apparently didn't realize it. That's exactly right. So verse 8, immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were reasoned, or they reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed and walk. Now listen carefully, verse 10. If you don't have this underlined in your Bible, and if you don't have a note over there in Luke chapter 23, you need to make sure you make the connection to Mark 2 and verse 10. Jesus said, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Jesus said, as I'm walking this earth, I have the authority from God to forgive sins. And understand how I'm saying this next point. Any way I choose. Jesus is not going to do anything to violate His nature. He's not going to uh, forgive sins of impenitent people. But He had the authority from God the Father to forgive sins as He walked on this earth. And it was up to Him to determine how He's going to do that. And by the way, this is not the only time that Jesus forgave sins. But Mark 2, in verse 10, if someone brings up the thief on the cross, you need to know Mark 2 and verse 10. If you think I'm writing on Mark 2 and verse 10, I am. Because I'm trying to implant it in your memory and I want you to remember Mark 2 and verse 10. Jesus can forgive sins any way that He wants. So back to Luke chapter 23. When Jesus in verse 43 tells this man that uh, you're going to be with me today in paradise, Jesus had the authority to say that. Now, we know that in Hebrews chapter 7 that the Bible tells us that a will goes into effect when? When the person dies. After the death of the testator. After the person dies. So Jesus could forgive this man's sin. You know, you don't hear people say, well, I want to be healed like the paralyzed man. 
We always, they always go to the thief on the cross because that's the one that is so, uh, uh, I guess, so uh, graphic. They say, well, what about the thief on the cross? Well, what about the man that was paralyzed? What about the woman that had the issue of blood? What about this person and that person? Over and over again, we could say, well, I want to be healed like them. Or I want to be saved like them. But we hear people always go to the thief on the cross. And what we explain to them is, wait a minute. Mark 2 and verse 10 says Jesus has power on this earth to forgive sins. Now that He has died, His last will and testament is now in effect. And the only way for someone to be saved today is by doing what Jesus commanded in Mark 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. I don't think that concept is that hard to grasp. Do y'all? Is that is that is it is that over our heads? But as long as Jesus was alive, you were correct. I mean, the New Testament wasn't in effect. That's right. And under the old law, show me where baptism is required. It's not. There it's you not. And like you said, he's the God man. He had the right. That's right. To forgive sin. So if you make notes in your Bible, write by Luke 23 and verse 43, Mark 2 and verse 10. Jesus has power to forgive sins. So did Jesus forgive this man's sin? Obviously, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And by the way, we realize that from Luke chapter 16 that that paradise is that Hadean realm that Jesus went into that Hadean realm, at least His Spirit went into the Hadean realm. His body went into the ground, but His Spirit went into the Hadean realm, or He went into paradise, Abraham's bosom. And then, of course, that Spirit came out of the grave, uh, out of that Hadean realm, three days later. So in verse 44, the Bible says, and it was about the sixth hour, which is noon, and uh, it says there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. So darkness on the face of the earth for three hours. Uh, by the way, and, and I'm not, uh, I'm not a, an educated man by any means, but I, I've heard a lot of people say that there is evidence around the globe in the first century of darkness. I mean, it, it wasn't an eclipse because you know about an eclipse, right? You've got to be in the right place at the right time or it's not going to, the sun's not going to be eclipsed by the moon. And so if it's going to, that's why here what in about a month and a half or so so whatever whenever it is uh, april 8th i think it is uh, we're going to be inundated by people that are going to come to our area because we're in the path of this eclipse but notice it says darkness was over the face of the earth that's why i know this was not just your run-of-the-mill eclipse and that's of course what uh Atheists and agnostics want to tell us, well, it was just an eclipse of the sun, and it was just a, no. It says darkness over the face of the earth, and they are saying, and I, and I have a trace down their documentation. They say one of the biggest proofs of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is this darkness that was recorded around the world at this time. Hmm. So. It's like the sun just went out. It just God just turned off the light. Mm -hmm. And only God can do that, right? right? All right. So, the Bible says that when this happened, verse 45, the veil of the temple was torn in half. The veil of the temple was torn in half. I want us to think about that veil being torn in half. And I want us to notice Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 51. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 51. Wasn't that veil made of seal skin or some kind of animal skin? It wasn't a, you know, a 
flimsy material. It was an animal skin. It, it was uh, the the uh, and and I don't remember. I think it was badger, but I, I have to go back to the Old Testament and look at the uh, the type of skin that it was. But it was the skin of an animal. It wasn't. Uh, <laughs> Well, but even if it weren't, if, if you tried to climb up there and tear the curtains of that baptistry down, it takes a mighty man to do that. Uh, when we were in high school, our ag teacher, uh, and I saw him do it, took a Dallas phone book, and in his hands, he ripped that Dallas phone, and it was that thick. I've seen that. And he ripped that thing in half. He was a very strong man. He had been a dairy farmer, so I guess he had milked a lot of cows in his lifetime, but he just had big, huge bird of hand. He tore that. But that is an unusual feat. Mm -hmm. But in Matthew 27 and verse number 51, the Bible says, Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Now notice what Matthew adds to this discussion. It was torn from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks were torn. So in this, this veil was torn from the top to the bottom. Matthew 27 and verse 51. If you remember back when we talked about the temple, this veil would have been about 30 feet tall. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not a little short curtain that's that stretched across. The veil, and I, I've got the dimensions, I don't have to remember, but I think it's 30 feet. Uh, so a man, and this is the point, could not have torn that veil. It had to be God is the one that tore the veil. And not man. If it were men being the height of that curtain, if they had the strength to do it, they would tear it from the bottom and rip it up, but it's torn from the top down. Another sign that what is going on is absolutely orchestrated by God. So the veil was torn in two. So let's go back now to Luke 23. Yes, sir? Read uh, the next verse. Well, we're going to get there. <laughs> we'll get there, but we're, we're going through this. Remember, as we said, Luke gives it in the chronological order, but Luke doesn't, Luke doesn't mention what we're going to see in verse 52 of Matthew chapter 27. Looks like that veil may have been made of linen. Was it a linen veil? Looks like it. It was about five, six inches thick. Okay. I, I, what verse is that? I'm in Exodus 26, verse 31. Wasn't it made of purple and all colors? It says blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen. And you said Exodus 26? Mm hmm So Exodus 26 and what? 31. So Exodus 26 and verse 31, as uh, Moses is being instructed by God on the building of the veil, uh, it says, And thou shalt make an hanging, Luke, uh, Luke, Exodus 26 and verse 36, Thou shalt make a hanging for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet, fine twine linen wrought with needlework, and thou shalt make for the hanging five pillars of chittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and their hook shall be of gold, and thou shalt cast five sockets of brass for them. Uh, that yeah. wasn't for the Holy of Holies, though, I don't think, was it? Carrie? Yes. Or, or y'all got the what, hanging such that bring the ark of the was over the, the roof. Was I'm the sorry? Roof. The badger hides and skins was the roof. Okay. We, we just got... A, That's where I got mixed up. A little bit yes. So, so the outer part of the temple was made with various skins of animals. I'm, I'm thinking that verse 31 may be the the one that we're talking about. Well, it says in 33 where it hung, and that might help. Okay. So in verse 31, okay, it said because in my Bible it's got verses 31 and 35 talking about the inner veil. Verses 36 and 37 talking about the outer veil, the door that, that they would enter. So are we talking about the one between the holy and most yes, holy? Yes, okay, That's what it says here in 33. Okay, so look at verse 31. Thou shalt make a veil of blue, purple, scarlet, fine twine linen. 
of cunning work with cherubim shall it be made. Thou shalt hang it upon the, upon the four uh, pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their uh, hooks shall be of gold with, uh, upon the four sockets of silver. Thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches. Uh, that's the hooks that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil, the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat. We're not going to read the rest of that. So that's the veil. It was made of fine linen. And so I apologize saying the, the skin. Uh, Verse 14 is where, where I think we got that. You should also make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent. Yeah, kind of covering a badger skins. Right. Like that. That's yeah. Weird. Yeah, and so I, and I got a little mixed up. <laughs> and if y'all don't know it before, my forgetter works real good, and I got it confused. But it was made of linen. Carrie, is this the same? It's, this temple's been rebuilt twice since this was. Good. Yeah, it's it's going to be built to those specifications. Uh, and when we get to, and this is where it's. Uh, as David is saying, that was the tabernacle. Then Solomon built the temple, but he used the same basic layout on the temple. So it did have... Boy, and I, I, I'm having to think of what it looked like. Uh, I think even in the temple it was linen with cherubims on it. That temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, then it was rebuilt uh, by Ezra, Nehemiah, and that group that came in. And so they rebuilt the temple, but they followed basically the same pattern. So uh, it would be the same type of veil. Uh, it would be, you know, with the cherubims and all that, which is the angels that are going to be car or, or woven into it. So uh, even though that was the tabernacle and then the temple and then the second temple, uh, that inner working would be the same. And that's uh, over in First Kings somewhere. Uh, you can read the whole book and find it. <laughs> so uh, okay. I've got to get back to where I was verse 45 Luke 23 and verse 45 and when Jesus or when the sun was dark and the veil of the temple uh, was rent in the midst and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice he said father into thy hands I commend my spirit and having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things that were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. And uh, so... His side is going to be pierced. And I, I'm trying to go through this. We'll, I'll try to get everything wrapped up, but this is a tall order. So turn over to John chapter 19, beginning in verse 31. Jesus has given up the ghost. Verse 30, I said 31. Look at verse 30. John 19 and verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, He said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came up the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, verse 33, and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. What's the significance of verse 33? It was prophesied way on back yonder that not a bone would be broken. Not a bone would be broken. <laughs> now the other two obviously are still alive. Why, why break their legs? Because they died quicker. Okay. Because as we pointed out last week, if you remember the illustration, as they were hanging, uh, as they hung down, they couldn't breathe. And so they would use their legs to mm -hmm. raise themselves up, get a breath of air, maybe two or three, however many breaths, they, and then they would have to collapse their legs. So they broke their legs so they couldn't do that. So basically they asphyxiated. They, they just 
suff uh, suffocated to death as they're hanging on the cross. When they get to Jesus, they see that He's dead already, so they do not break His legs. By the way, as we said just a moment ago, that was a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies that not a bone would be broken just as with the Passover lamb. And so verse number 34, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and the Bible says and forthwith came out there blood and water. What is the water that he's talking about? The cleansing water. Okay, the cleansing water. It would be the, the fluids that are built up around the lungs yeah. and the hearts, but it is the fact that the Bible tells us that it is in the watery grave of baptism that we contact the blood. And there's significance that there was blood and water that came out. Uh, again, I am constantly amazed that people in the world want to uh, be so upset about members of the Lord's church saying that when Jesus Christ gave the command for us to be crucified, that somehow people in the world uh, just want to have a connection fit and think that somehow that uh, we are coming up with some far-fetched scheme about how baptism <coughs> is essential to our salvation. The fact of the matter is, it is the Bible, it is God, and it is not us that added baptism to the new covenant. It's not us that did that. It's God. And out came blood and water. And so then they're going to bury Jesus Christ. Uh, man, there's not enough time. Look at Luke 23 again. Somebody needs to take that battery out of that clock. <laughs> we got next week if it's possible. <laughs> So let's go back to Luke 23. And verse 50. Behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and just. The same had not consented to the counsel, and deed of them he was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. So what kind of man is Joseph that we often call him Joseph of Arimathea? What kind of man was he? He was a rich man for sure. Okay, he's a wealthy man. Seemed right. to be a member of the Sanhedrin. Righteous man, member of the Sanhedrin. Looking for the kingdom of God, looking for the Messiah. And when all of this is transpiring, he does not agree with the death penalty that has been raised against Jesus Christ, as a matter of fact, he argues against the death penalty because the Bible tells us that he consented not with the counsel and the deed that was done. So verse 52, this man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. He took it down, wrapped it in linen, laid it on the sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never a man before was laid. What's the significance of verse 53? When it's a brand new place of death. I'm sorry? A brand new burial place. Why is it important that it is a brand new burial place where no body has laid? Why is that significant? No, no other sin has been there. Okay. No sin that's uncontaminated. What did you say? No other sinner has been there. Okay, no sinner has been there. Nobody has risen from that. Nobody would have been buried in that grave that had been a prophet or something that might have influenced the, the, uh, him being able to be risen from the dead. So do you remember in, um, and I'm trying to think of where it is, in, in um, 
Elisha the prophet had died and there was a battle that was being fought and there was a man that was dead and in haste, instead of burying the man, and you're going to have to read 1st, 2nd, 3rd and 4th Kings, that's 1st and 2nd Chronicles as well. Uh, but it, it reminds us that when they threw this man's body in the haste, they didn't have time to bury they threw him in the ground, and when he touched the bones of Elisha, he came to life. And so the significance is that it is not the tomb of a prophet of God, like Elisha, who when that happened, he, this man rose and everybody saw it and they were amazed. By the way, that is a promise of the resurrection for us as well. He touched the bones of Elisha. He came back to life. And so uh, they put him in a tomb so that nobody had been there before. So they weren't burying him with Elisha or some other prophet that there's a possibility of coming. And of course, those that deny the resurrection aren't going to accept that anyway. Uh, but... Uh, that is what happened in the Old Testament. I apologize, I didn't think to run that reference down, but you can look up. Uh, I have Isaiah 53 9 as a reference to that one, but that doesn't seem right. No, this is. Uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea probably didn't realize he was fulfilling scripture. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know that he knew that or not. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like he did. So, uh, 2 Kings 13 and verse 21. 2 Kings 13 and verse 21. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that behold, they spied a band of men and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. That's 2 Kings 13 and verse 21. Uh, so they, it had to be an empty tomb because if it was not an empty tomb, then the detractors would say, well, something that, that do believe in God, do believe, they would say, well, it, it's just like what happened with this man when he touched Elisha's bones, he came alive. So it wasn't a resurrection in, in uh, a unique sense. Well, it was. It was in, buried in a new tomb in which no man had ever laid. Wow. So, uh, as I said a moment ago, we're, we're just basically out of time. Uh, so, I apologize, Cliff, we didn't get to Luke, or not Luke, Matthew 27 and verse 52. Uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, verse 52 and verse 53. This is where the people that were in the graves came out. So let's go ahead and go there quickly and look at it. So back to Matthew 27. In verse 52, when you're reading verses 51 and 52, it almost seems like that when the veil of the temple was rent and the earthquake happened, that the graves were opened and many of the saints that were there arose. But you've got to read it in its entirety. It says in verse 53, they came out of their graves when? After his. After Jesus' resurrection. So they were not resurrected prior to Jesus. They were resurrected after Jesus. Is that where you were getting to a moment ago? Yeah. That's missed a lot, that after. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it'll, if you're not careful just reading it, it seems like, well, the, the veil is torn, there's an earthquake, and then all these saints get up and go into town. But you got to continue reading to notice that it says it was actually after his resurrection that the tombs were opened and they went into the city of Jerusalem. By the way, that's another proof of the resurrection of Christ. There's so much of this. And uh, can you imagine living at that time and seeing Grandma and Grandpa? <laughs> Walk through the door again after they've been dead for a while. <laughs> I had uh, made a new door. <laughs> yeah, you're like, 
Wait a minute. What is the Well, I know that guy, but he died. He's been buried for two years. What's he doing walking up and down the street? <laughs> they, they also died again. They did. They, they died, died again. again. Yeah. They died again. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it, it had to be people that they knew of that day. That's right. exactly right. Mm -hmm. They would have known the people because it was the Old Testament saints that had died and they were resurrected after Christ. They came into the city. Uh, I was hoping to get to this. Oh, we'll have to do it next week. Next Wednesday, next Wednesday night, uh, we will come back. We will continue looking at this <coughs> harmony of the four accounts of the gospel, trying to weave them together so that we get the full picture. Uh, by the way, the the atheist and the ag excuse me agnostics really attack the the account of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They say. There are so many contradictions. These are their words. So many contradictions uh, that Matthew says, well, you know, uh, there was an earthquake and, and Mark, Luke, John don't mention an earthquake. So, so why is there all this discrepancy? And, and when you answer them, well, these are complimentary, then their response usually is, well, don't you think that Mark would have thought it was important enough that if there was an earthquake that he would have reported it too? And so you've got Matthew reporting an earthquake, Mark, Luke, John don't mention it, so there's a contradiction. Well, brethren, as we've said over and over again, God uses an economy of words. If you can imagine what the Bible would look like if God specified every detail of every event. That's why there are four accounts of the Gospel accounts so that we can weave them together, so we can get a full picture. But imagine if Matthew records an earthquake, Mark records an earthquake, Luke records an earthquake, and John records an earthquake, what are the atheists going to say then? They'd find something else. Well, they'd say, well, they just copied each other. Yeah. They just, they just copied each other, and so it's nothing special. They just copied whatever. And this, again, is another proof of the Scriptures being of God. Uh, we know that they complement one another, and we know that the atheists can attack that, but they don't. it doesn't stand, just like the theory of evolution doesn't have a leg to stand on. I, I'm amazed that all the information that you hear on the Internet pushing evolution it's on television, it's on the internet, it's in our schools, it's uh, everywhere you go, they're pushing this theory of evolution. Uh, atheists have gotten the upper hand right now, and that's why the people of God need to stand uh, very strongly against this, but it's one of those almost you can't win. Well, if we say Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John recorded the exact same thing in the exact same way, they're saying they're just copying from one another. You know, I, I, I run up against some, something similar to that and uh, using your example. Well, how, how come uh, Mark, Luke, and John didn't record it? And I say, okay, wait a minute. They didn't deny it either. Yeah. Throw yeah. it right back at them. And, yeah. and so that tells me it could have happened. They just didn't remember it or yeah, God chose not to put it in there. Well, and, and we all realize that the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They're writing by the inspiration of God. So they have it exactly right. And they have exactly what God intended for them to write. And for us to argue about some of the details is ridiculous. If we can weave this picture together, we can see that it is coherent. We can see that it records all these things. And as we uh, look, and we're not going to have time to go, but this was all foretold in the Old Testament. This, none of this is done without being foretold in the Old Testament. So we're, Lord willing, we'll come back to this. And uh, we'll come back next Wednesday. The following Wednesday night, I'm going to be at a gospel meeting over in Lufkin. Uh, Brother Don's going to be filling in for me. So uh, if we don't get it wrapped up next week, then uh, two weeks after that, we should be able to get this all done. And then 
we will move to the book of Ecclesiastes. So, uh, anyway, I just, uh, I look at this and I think what Jesus did for us and the power of His resurrection, which we're going to be talking about as we go through this. I'm going to go ahead and jump through a couple of screens to get you where we're going to be talking about. I want you to think about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This illustration was done by a member of the Lord's Church by the name of Robert Swain. He was riding with Brother Ron Boatwright on a series of... Uh, Bible studies. And by the way, you can go search Ron Boatwright. And uh, he has lessons that you can take online, Bible correspondence courses. Uh, so they, they slightly altered that, as it said, to give us uh, digital use. But it is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And that is reenacted when a sinner dies. They are buried in water and resurrected and walk in newness of life. And so that again is that same uh, man, Brother Robert Swain, in his illustration. This one uh, comes from World Video Bible School. Uh, and it's a great picture. They have a chart, a poster that you can use with this. Uh, but I want us to think about this picture when we're thinking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We need to have that picture in our mind. And this is the reason we stress the necessity of baptism. So this evening, we've already looked at that Roman soldier piercing the side of Jesus and out came blood and water. And I want you to think about that illustration. If you're not a Christian, we're pleading with you to respond to the Gospel this very hour. As a child of God, if you need prayers, please come as we stand and as we sing.